Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. This is Geek Tavern Radio. This is Dax, and I am joined by these two comrades who have carried this podcast for the past three to four weeks, and they are. I'm Mike Bundy. I am Shill. Thank you so kindly, Dax, for your your kind words. Uh, we are happy to have you back. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, I've just been having a lot going on. Um, we well, built you know, a fence hardly- in a day. Uh, yeah, I mean, roughly it, it took two weekends, but you know, it took a day on each of those weekends. So roughly two days build a, it was kind of spontaneous. My wife wanted a fence put in the front yard for our three dogs so that they wouldn't run off. So we did that. Hopefully they don't just go underneath it. Well, yeah, see, that's why we still have to, I think what we're going to do is we're going to take like some nice wire fence and down underneath it, we are going to place it down there. And of course it's going to touch the ground so that they don't get out because Dax, I mean, Dax, Jax, um, <laughs> one of the dogs already has uh, solved how to get through the fence. And that's by going through the pickets, which we knew beforehand the pickets were, you know, the space between each picket was just big enough so that, you know, Jax or Maisie or any of my dogs who are special guests on this episode. Um, They're so tiny (laughs) all the time. But um, yeah, between that and trying to, you know, spend time with my wife and, uh, you know, she's had family come down. And so, I mean, just between a lot of family time, that fence and uh, my the days that I work on the weekend being uh, flash, you know, just being bounced back and forth between Saturday or Sunday. Yeah. It's kind of interrupted me. It's kind of taken me away from this. Oh, that's all right. We're glad to have you back. Yeah. I mean, you guys, you guys did honestly not kissing your ass. You guys did fantastic. You know, these past couple of weeks that I've been gone, like you guys have been entertaining and just, I, I loved it. I listened to every single episode. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, well, I mean, now that we're we're all here, let's just dive into it, right? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Um, okay. <laughs> let's just, can, I, can I say this? Can I can I just say one? Go thing? ahead. Go ahead. So many good things in pop culture, and I, I mean, there's just so many good things that are out right now. God of War being out. Yeah, uh, God of War. I mean, so far from what I played, I, I I believe I can speak on behalf of Mike Bundy and myself, but it's a fantastic game. It's awesome. So between that, uh, the new Magic the Gathering set, Dominaria. Right, and, Dominaria is blowing it out of the water. I love yes. everything about that set. Like, yeah, I, I, I'm touching a little bit of uh, MTG Arena lately, mm-hmm. and Dominaria is... Mm-hmm is now live in it and it's just so great it is it so great is. it's such a fun set i mean if if you've fallen out of magic you got to jump back in and uh and most importantly the big big thing that's out right now is avengers infinity war and let me tell you how big it is because it actually beat star wars force awakens for the biggest opening weekend Wow, that's absolutely crazy! Like, and, and, and that's and that, all that happened before Sunday even barely started. Wow! Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow! I mean, it is a pop culture icon, and it would be a, tra- a a real tragedy if we, as a podcast, did not discuss the events of Infinity War. This is your warning. This will be a spoiler filled podcast because we are going to discuss Infinity War, all of it. The whole thing, full spoilers and all. We're going to talk the the whole set of Marvel movies. We're going to talk about the events that took place in Infinity War and where they came from and how these ideas came to pass. Like we, it, it this is a full spoiler podcast. I mean, if you yeah. didn't, if you didn't catch that in the title of the episode, then you know you can't blame us at this point for the movie being spoiled for you. Absolutely nope. not. And if you haven't seen the movie, go watch the movie. Right, because it's that. Like, what good. are you doing with your life? You know? Yeah, yeah. What are you doing with your life? <laughs> this, is, this is what I. This is what I said. I, I went to work the following day, 
And uh, one of my coworkers, Leo, who's a big, big comic book fan and whatnot. And he's like, oh, you, you seen it? And I respond, yeah, I, I did. And I asked him, I said, hey, Leo, you've got kids, right? And he goes, yeah, why? And I said, I don't know how that's possible. And he goes, why was that? And I said, you thought you lost your virginity? A while ago, I said, you haven't lost your virginity yet until you've seen this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, like, my. Yeah. oh, my. Oh, my. Hilarious. Hey, let's uh, let's delve into this. Um, so Avengers Infinity War, long time coming. It's finally here. And man, does this start off with a bang? I mean, just like any movie and like most movies should, the opening scene should always capture the audience and it should basically emphasize the tone and what the movie is Mm -hmm. about. Yes, absolutely. And the very beginning does just that. So we are left off where Thor Ragnarok left off that. Yeah. Thor Ragnarok ends with, with uh, the Asgardians uh, trying to find a new home and, um, and right off the bat, you're thrown right back into that scenario and uh, Thanos has blown up their ship. Yeah, basically uh, uh, writing off everything that Ragnarok did. Yeah, Pretty yeah, much. yeah, absolutely. I which mean, is all right. Yeah, <laughs> which is all right. Ragnarok's still a yeah. great movie, but and, yeah. And in, in detail, before he even like blows up the ship, this is where the Black Order. I mean, they're really introduced. In this, I'm trying to remember all the names of them. Uh, Corvus, I'm trying to remember some of the names. That's okay if you don't. Yeah, yeah. Um, But anyhow, we see Heimdall still alive, and we can assume maybe even Valkyrie. I mean, you don't even see her at all, but I would assume she's in this pile of, of Asgardian bodies. And Heimdall's, you know, barely breathing. Loki's there, and you can just see Thor has gotten the crap beat out of him, who Mm -hmm. we can assume by is Thanos. Absolutely. And in turn, basically Thanos reminds us that, you know, he resurrected Loki. He brought back Loki and that um, Loki needs to hand over the Tesseract. And Thor doesn't even, you know, Thor even states like, hey, we don't even have that. And here this whole time, matter of fact, Loki indeed had the Tesseract. Yeah, he stole it. In, he stole it in Ragnarok yep. um, and and hung on to it just to make sure that he had it. And that's ultimately the reason Thanos attacks them. Right. Because yep. Loki has an infinity stone and Thanos wants it. And man, I'll tell you what a powerful scene to, to see Hulk just get annihilated as well. Yeah, yeah, right. So Hulk Hulk enters the scene and starts to fight Thanos and is just manhandled in seconds by him. Yeah. Right. And that's that sets the tone for how powerful Thanos is without the infinity stone. Well, he's got well, he's got he's the got he's got the power, power at that point, yes. Which he got from Xandar, which again that leads us to an like And that's the one that's the one that was handed over at the end of Guardians of the Galaxy. The, to to the Nova Corps, and yep. it's later revealed in the film that Thanos. Um, maybe it's revealed in that moment that Thanos uh, wiped out. Literary. Yeah, wiped out all life on Xandar. Like he just destroyed it yeah. and took that Infinity Stone for himself. It's being rumored that that was part of the movie, but they cut that out. Oh, okay. Mm. Okay, I'm sure that there will be a big director's cut at some point. Yeah. Um, you know, with maybe 10 to 15 minutes worth of content that wasn't in this film. Um, because, you know, the sometimes uh, sometimes the movie length is just too short or too long for, for in theaters. You yeah. know what I mean? So they cut out some of the, the less intense scenes. And we've seen that across practically every single DC movie, much to the detriment of the movie. Right. However, so anyway, uh, back to to Thanos. So Loki makes an agreement with Thanos, says that if you spare Thor's life, uh, I will give you the Infinity Stone. And he he honors that agreement, which is good. It shows that Thanos has a little bit of honor in him. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so it it, it brings him down to a level where he he could possibly uh, have this personality 
where you you can uh, empathize with him slightly, which comes in into full force a little bit later. But so he spares Thor, and after he defeats the Hulk, what's his name? The guy that teleports him? Heimdall. Heimdall. As he defeats Hulk, Heimdall teleports Hulk back to Earth. I mean, we knew that that was where he was going to end up. Uh, he teleports him away and sends him back to Earth so that he can warn everyone of Thanos. But Thanos' final act, after Loki swears allegiance to him and tries to kill him, is to uh, strangle Loki. And he just he just lifts him up, and you you watch Thanos choke the life out of Loki. He crushes his wooden pipe. He just... Yeah. 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 Straight up. And that that's how brutal this character is set up right in the beginning, in the opening scene. And it's just such a great moment to show how evil Thanos is and, and how he will, he will do anything to get what he wants. With that said, now he has acquired the space stone and of course the power stone, which, you know, he apparently had right in the beginning of the film. So next thing is we see just like from the trailer, we see something dropping from the sky over New York city guy. And he actually lit, uh, lands in the uh, Santorum of Doctor Strange. And there, Doctor Strange is uh, having a discussion about what he's going to buy Wong uh, from the market, which um, I, I don't even want to get into that because, again, it's too detailed. I mean, we get to, we, we obviously get to see from here what life is like after Doctor Strange and uh, kind of get a little hint at what Doctor Strange has been doing, but it also goes and or well the hulk actually before i cut over to the next scene where it shows pepper Potts and tony stark dr strange um and wong as they're discussing coming down the stairs that's when hulk falls through and through the santorum and then just goes through the staircase and they look at the hole you know and they here's bruce banner yeah here's 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 bruce banner bruce banner well the hulk turning back to Bruce Banner, and then this is where he says, Thanos is coming. Very Paul Revere-like. The credits pop up, and then we're led into uh, Tony Stark's life. Right. Bundy, what was your interjection? Just that uh, two seconds earlier, Doctor Strange and Wong would have been hit by Hulk coming through the, the ceiling there. Right. Like, that was the first thought I had. Like, wow, the timing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that timing was was something else. Um, <laughs> it was good. It was a good moment. So, uh, you know, we have the the initial interaction with uh, Tony Stark and Doctor Strange and Hulk and all of those folks. Uh, and he warns Tony about Thanos. Tony says that he's going to make the call to Steve Rogers. He's got that that burner flip phone. Like <laughs> that was absolutely great. It's like I oh I've got. Cap's number, just in case I need it. But, uh, but yeah, he he decides he's going to make the call, and then that's when Thanos is uh, black is is the Black Order drops right into New York City immediately, right? Like they're they're just thrown right into it. There's no hype. There's no uh, there's no build, and you're just thrown right into the action. Um, and you know. Tony Stark, Doctor Strange, uh, Spider Man shows up because he's on a field trip, and they see the the he sees the UFO come in. Uh, Spider Man comes over, and all of those characters they uh, they interject and start fighting the Black Order because they're trying to get Doctor Strange's Infinity Stone. Yeah, which which but, might be the the most important Infinity Stone, to be honest. Yes, more than, it's it's got a level of power and control to it that is unparalleled. Uh, to be able to rewind the events of time are, are just so important. Yeah. Um, so they're trying to get the stone. Uh, they take off th- th- through the fight scene. Through the fight scene, they capture Doctor Strange. He's got this spell on his Infinity Stone so that it's protected. But <laughs> Squidward. <laughs> Squid- yeah, e- Ebony Maw. <laughs> Squidward captures Doctor Strange and takes him back to uh decides he's gonna take him back to Thanos and have just have Thanos deal with him to get the Infinity Stone. And uh in that process, Iron Man and Spider Man are stowaways. 
on the the ship and they they climb aboard. Spider Man's actually <laughs> they did that, they did that parachute, yeah they did that parachute joke from from Homecoming where that Tony Stark releases his parachute <laughs> and he gets sucked away, but Spider Man managed to hang on to the spaceship, which was great. But I just love the, that little throwback. The reveal of the Iron Spider outfit, you know. Oh Tony, yes. Tony yeah, you know, well, Spider Man is hanging on to the donut, as Tony Stark later calls it, and he's losing air because they're getting so high in the atmosphere. Yep. And so Tony shoots him with his nanobites that, you know, make up this new Iron Spider suit, as well as Iron Man's new suit. You know, it's just nanobites. Yep. And uh so yeah, so that he's able to breathe and so he stays on the ship, like you so said. So Yep, just so good. Um and the the reveal of the claws when he sucked away from the uh where he does what, what this kid does, what Tom Holland does. You ever see that old movie Alien? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'm glad that that's a gimmick, you know, for yeah. Spider Man now. Yep, I absolutely love it. So um so he does that and they blow the hole in the ship to to suck out to suck out Squidward. But and he catches himself with the with the claws. I popped at those claws, man. Like I was like, oh yeah. great, those are amazing. Right? Because I did, did the Iron Spider from Civil War have those? Um I I think so. From the comic book? Yeah, I, I believe okay. so. Okay, because they did those in um Superior Spider Man as well. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Octavius, Doc Ock, when he took over Spider-Man's body, made improvements to the suit, and that those were one of the improvements. Yeah. So uh it was just so it was great. But yeah, I, I popped when that when those those claws came out and caught him from falling into space. We didn't get to see uh a Karen at all though in this movie. Or hear Karen, I guess you could say. Karen. Oh, that's his that's his um AI, Spider Man's yeah, AI. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's Bro. true. We didn't have uh what's what's Tony's new one's name as well? I can't remember. Yeah, we didn't hear much from her either. I don't uh, think we heard anything, did we? Yeah, just yeah. when he told her to release the spider suit. Oh, okay, right. When he shot it from the Avengers Tower. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, yeah, those those it was a great scene. So those guys are in space. And then we flash over to um Guardians of the Galaxy, right? Yeah. When the Guardians um, were traveling through space to follow the distress be- beacon, uh, to do what the Guardians do best, charge people to assist them. <laughs> they're, going yeah. to the, they're going to the Asgardian distress signal. And as they enter from hyperspace, uh, they, they hit Thor with their ship. Because <laughs> uh, they get a distress signal, of course. And Yeah, yeah, of course. And Thor's the only one that's, uh, that's still living because he is a god. So he, he, they pull him in, have their conversation with him. Several jokes about his <laughs> his sexiness is made. All right, I, I'm going to interject because I actually have a problem with this, and it's going to be one of the the few problems I have with this movie. So in this banter of his sexiness, there comes a joke where they are basically body shaming Chris Pratt, and mm-hmm. I just he's not fat. Yeah. Would, like, they, would they say he's one sandwich away from? Yeah, they were making fun of. Well, they were making fun of his character, yeah. right? Because Star Lord's character is uh, is I that type of guy who just doesn't care. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So I I thought it was funny because like because of Star Lord's character. You know, they're just ragging on him. But Chris Pratt is a, is a pretty built guy. Like he oh, got yeah. really. He got really built for the Star Lord character. Yeah, I think they were just—that's my point. He was, like, they were ragging on his insecurity, yeah. right? Like Star Lord had his own insecurity about the the scenario, so they're ragging on him about that. And I, I think it was just meant to be like a sarcastic, like, "Hey, you're you know you're one sandwich away from being a tub of lard." <laughs> I I just I don't know. Maybe it's because he used to be, you know, a bigger guy. Yeah, yeah. It's great for him to to take over his body and make it. No, I don't it think is, it was. But... I don't think it was connected to Chris Pratt at all. I think it was connected to Star Lord as a character and his own insecurity. I know. I just it didn't sit well with me. I don't know. Okay, but... okay. <laughs> uh, 
I, I really loved that that whole scene, um, especially Thor, Colin, Rocket, Rabbit, the whole movie. Like well, that, that was just incredibly that's an ongoing thing throughout the whole movie, and it might be my favorite thing about you know one of my favorite ha ha moments throughout the whole movie. Right, every I'm so time happy. he would say Rabbit, I would laugh probably way too much at it every time, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's a that's a good thing that they've developed over Thor as well throughout the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe. He he has those jokes where he just calls something incorrectly the whole time. Yeah, right. They've done that over over past Thor movies as well, so it's kind of ingrained in his character at this point. Yeah. So, um, but that whole interaction as as they go through it, they decide that they're going to um to split up. Uh, and one of them, one group of them is going to go to nowhere to get an infinity stone. And Thor is going to go to that forge that I can't remember the name of, but he's going to go get to the forge to make a new hammer. That was yeah. his objective so that he could, um, so that he could drive it through Thanos's heart. Uh, Another key part to this scene is it, it's actually a good, uh, an awesome part of Rocket's uh, writing is he takes body parts like he yes. For no reason. So he randomly has a working eye that Thor can put in his, you know, missing eye sock. Yes. And uh, so now Thor just has an eye again. Yep. Yep. Because it's Rocket's character. He steals prosthetic limbs all the time. Yeah. Um, So and then one other final crucial moment is that Gamora asks Star-Lord, asks Peter to to kill her if Thanos ever gets his hands on her because she knows something that Thanos doesn't. Right. Right. And he, she does not want to reveal it. So that's a fairly critical moment and a critical juncture in the film. And um, so, yeah, Peter makes that promise. And then we, we jump into nowhere um, where the collector is from the first guardians of the galaxy. And they're going to see him to get his infinity stone so that they can protect it. And when they get there, they have that the encounter with Thanos because he's already there. And Thanos is speaking to the collector and uh, trying to torture him into getting the uh, infinity gem. And Gamora confronts Thanos, uh, has a little fight scene because Thanos doesn't expect her to, to hurt him. Uh, she gets to stab him in the heart. And, you know, you think that it's you think that that's the moment that's like, oh, where? so there's a twist coming, you know, uh, there's there's some kind of twist coming or, um, you know, maybe maybe Thanos isn't the big baddie in all of this. And maybe right. the collector is going to be the the guy that tries to get the Infinity Stones or something. But it turns out that Thanos used the reality stone to shift reality to trick them into thinking that she could kill him. Yeah, because he already has the the reality infinity stone that the collector had, and in that moment, the collector is just dead. (laughs) I believe so. Yes, I believe the collector is just dead. Um, but that is that was a a big reveal and a big moment. Um, and through that exchange, Thanos captures Gamora, and Star Lord fails in his promise to kill her. But they, you know, he actually does pull the trigger in the moment. Oh, yes. But but Thanos uses the reality stone yet again and makes bubbles come out instead of, you know, the, um, you know, the plasma the laser beam or, or whatever it, yeah. it is. Yeah. What a great moment. <laughs> so, I mean, like, kudos to Peter Quill because he actually did it, you know. Right. He kept his promise, per se, but it didn't turn out nearly what anybody wanted or needed in that moment. And it just goes to show how powerful Thanos is becoming by by grabbing these Infinity Stones, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Like, it is, it is truly one of those moments where you see his power, on, his full power on display. And at this point, he's, he's basically already unstoppable. Yeah. You know, so you're like, holy crap, what are they going to do when he has the fourth one? Or right. the fifth one, like yeah, it's just building up to, uh, to you know moments. Big, bigger moments. Yeah. The next scene that we cut to is right after this. It's either right after this or before this, but it's going along. You know, the same time. It is. Uh, I was going to say Doctor Strange. It's going to be Vision 
and the Scarlet Witch, and we kind of get an insight on what they've been up to. And they're somewhere in the UK, kind of hiding out, living themselves and having discussions about, you know, them on whether or not they would ever go back and, you know, be a part of the Avengers or anything. And they're having a little bit of a, uh, I won't say a hissy fit, but, you know, they're just having a discussion about it. And as they walk the streets, they come across the TV on display in a glass that's showing the result of New York um, after Thanos, uh, Mobius Ma, and the uh, Black Dwarf, the the big dude, after what they've caused in New York. And then even on the television set, it says Tony Stark gone, nowhere can you know nowhere to be found. So right once that happens, the uh, Proxima Midnight. And the Corvus, I forget his name, they show up. So so they get into this battle. And so they're after the Mind Stone that is embedded in Vision's head. And there comes points where Corvus, who is the main offenser who keeps going after Vision. I mean, there, there's some points where you just think that, okay, yeah, Vision's going to die. Um, one of Vision's... Dude, I went into this movie. Full disclosure, I went into this movie being like, "So when's Vision gonna?" Like, yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I've been saying that. I've been saying that since oh. they put the the Mind Stone in his head. I, I was like, I thought he'd be the first one to go. To be honest with you, yeah, I thought he was. I I didn't <clears> think he'd make it past like a, another movie after Avengers two. Right, like I, I'm I'm sitting there and I'm like, so Vision's gonna die, right? Like that's what's got to happen here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yep. dude, they like they, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think most people could agree that the vi- you know vision, you know, was gonna die. I mean, what more impactful way? Oh, right there, we already spoiled it. Um, but I mean, in this scene, one of Vision's greatest powers is to become untethered. Right. He basically can go through walls. He can you know, push, lunge his hand into somebody and then become phaseable and, you know, just like rip out. Yeah. We've seen this actually displayed in age of Ultron. Well here, it just so happens the scepter that Corvus carries is one that disables vision from becoming tethered, which so, means, which means that Thanos has done his homework. Yes, he has. All right. And, and let's, Vision, I mean, he puts up a good fight, but he doesn't put up the fight that Scarlet Witch does. And this leads me to believe of just how powerful and I think detrimental Scarlet Witch can be against Mm -hmm. Thanos. Um, But she basically manhandles him. And in a moment where they lose uh, Proxima Midnight and Scarlet Witch notice something from behind this train that's passing by as they're fighting. And here he walks out from the dark and it is indeed a very rugged, uh, bearded. Look at this. They're going crazy. The dogs downstairs are just going nuts of the fact that I'm about to announce Captain America. Captain America walks through the dark into the light and Reyes Proxima throws her spear. Of course, Captain America catches it and throws it, and what, he hits, he doesn't hit her, he hits uh, Corvus, doesn't he? I believe so. Um, or someone, or no, never mind, I apologize, Black Widow is the one who in, injures Corvus, so Black Widow gets in on the fight and injures Corvus, and it just so happens, you know, they're they're about to win, and, you know, they, I, it was crazy. I think it was, uh, I don't know if it was Captain America or Black Widow, but as Proxima Midnight is tending to um, Corvus, one of those two state, uh, give yourself up or we'll kill you. Like it was something along those lines. It was really dark and just, you know, badass. And of course, Proxima Midnight says, you'll never have a chance like this again. And then they warp. And they're gone. So we're introduced to this, what, a third um, of the... Uh, yeah, you know, a third. Avengers. Yeah, yeah, definitely a third of the, the baddies because they have the... Um, 
the teleportation. But um, man, I got to say that scene was great because throughout it, we learned that um, Vision knows that Black uh, or that Scarlet Witch can um, can destroy the Infinity Stone. Yes. And through that scene and she he's pleading with her to do so. And it makes sense, too, because the Scarlet Witch, um, as well as her brothers, uh, Quicksilver, they were in this universe, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, their powers were born of a power stone, that being the Tesseracts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they were experimented on by Hydra. So, um, so yeah, they were born from the Infinity Stones, basically. From there, I know there's another scene. And, and see, that's the thing. And I, I'm going to tell you this right now. Um, it's one of the little complaints that people have. But this movie does jump back and forth because, again, that's one of my seeing, big ones. You're kind of you're kind of seeing three different sides. You're seeing um, these members, you know, for instance, uh, Groot, Rocket, and Thor. So you see their story, their path, their journey. Then you see Doctor Strange, Tony, Spider-Man, their journey. And then you see Captain America, um, you know, uh, Black Widow, you know, Bruce Banner, all them. You see their side of the story. And then, of course, you see Thanos's. So you're kind of getting four perspectives. And it right. and really does jump back and forth. That was um, one of my, that was one of my big complaints about the thing, man, is that overall, yeah. Overall, it feels like you're jumping around so much. See, I didn't right? get that. I didn't get that. Like, I was just so overwhelmed with everything that I was like, "All right, let's go." <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, see, I'm I'm one of those types of guys that, and this is a good interjection for our, some of our opinions of the film. But uh, I'm one of those guys that when you hop from location to location, and then you need to put the location at the bottom of the screen, you are doing a disservice to the people who are watching the movie. Okay. So like I, it's star Wars to me, right? Um, star Wars can jump from Tatooine to Dagobah to um, what's the name of the cloud city. Uh, they can jump to all those different locations and not tell you because they don't need to, because it doesn't, it doesn't do a disservice to the movie. For folks to um, to to not know exactly where they are in that film, well, but after, we, after they jumped, you know, the first times, so I don't think we really needed it. But right, I well, mean, I didn't think I didn't think we needed it in this film to to be told where we were. Right, so we jump after this scene. I believe we jumped to um, to Thanos's ship, and we're in inner. To, to this idea that she, that uh, Gamora and Thanos have this, this complicated relationship, which we know mm-hmm. from, uh, from several other movies. But, you know, it's just another location into the film. But uh, that's where, it's just one of those things that I, I felt like we didn't necessarily, you know, we didn't necessarily need to know the names of the locations uh, through a dialogue on the bottom of the screen, you know, because it pulls you away and makes you think it's like, Oh, okay, here's, here's another, here's another location. You know, I think that it would have probably been a better, better way to reveal it through, through just dialogue of the characters like star Wars does. Yeah. But they kind of did do that. Didn't they? Like they did. In addition, they added the names of the planets before they were there. You know, like Nowhere and um, Titan and all of those different locations. They put the the names at the bottom of the screen, but I just didn't think that was necessary. And, you know, I think it does a disservice to the movie itself if you can't rely on your own movie to tell the story. You know what I mean? Like, it's one of those writing cues, I suppose, that I, you know, because I like words and I like dialogue and things like that. If you can't tell your viewers where they are through lines of dialogue, then you're failing as a writer. In my opinion, I don't, I don't, my look, opinion. I don't look into it that deeply. Like, I yeah, just... it's it's just my opinion. You know, it's just one of those things that I, I'm not. By no means, I'm not knocking these these filmmakers. This movie was great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just it was one of those things that I just disliked about the movie was that they had to tell us through yeah. text on the screen where we were. So, yeah, Gamora 
and Thanos are on his ship. They are, you know, and you find out that Nebula uh, has been captured by Thanos is, and is being tortured. Gamora lies to Thanos at least twice. And yeah. he even states that, you know, after taking her in as his daughter, after basically killing all of her people, which, you know what, there is logic. See, that's the, where I have empathy for um, Thanos. One, you f- actually feel like he does love, actually love something. He loves Gamora. He mm-hmm. oh, has always visioned her as his daughter, but she recalls, you know, you killed my planet. Like you killed everybody, you know, pretty much. And he says, no, I actually killed half of your population because when I got to your planet, your planet was an overpopulated cesspool and you guys were running out of food and crops. So I did the thing that no one could do. And I had to do genocide. And now your planet flourishes. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I actually sense that there is actually truth in his statement. Because, again, Thanos wants to become God. He wants to have that ability to choose what path any type of humanity whatsoever on any planet in any universe. You know, he he wants to be able to, again, like said at the snap of his fingers, do as he does, does yeah. as he wants to. Um, you find out he's torturing Nebula, and he because he knows that Gamora. Yeah, yeah, Gamora, he knows that Gamora loves her more than anything else in the world, universe, absolutely, the universe, and that he that she knows where the stone is, and through that, um, it gets to a point where. He is torturing her and Nebula is screaming. Nebula insists that you do not tell him anything. And Gamora once again lies to Thanos and says, I have no clue where it is. I tried to find it for you, but I couldn't find it. I was unsuccessful. And then he reminds her once again, I've I've made you into a great warrior. I've, you know, I taught you how to do great things with all your abilities, but I never taught you how to lie. And here Nebula just so happens um, to have the ability to basically um, have her memory projected pretty much. Right. She's more machine. She's more machine yep. than, than uh, Nebula at this point. So she is an, she, she's still capable of free will, but she is a, a puppet of Thanos more than anything else. And he, you know, he's been recording her conversations and her memories and can access them. And he, she sees Gamora uh, reveals that she knows where the stone is. So Thanos, um, Thanos reveals that and tortures Nebula some more. And uh, Gamora finally cracks and, you know, tells him that, uh, that where the stone is. And uh, the next scene that we see with these two is them traveling to that planet. Yeah. um, And I'm trying to remember, exactly where it is but i don't remember it but man i i I, let me let me introduce this idea because this was one of my favorite parts of this whole movie so (laughs) because it was just a little nuanced thing from the marvel cinematic universe Mm -hmm. that you know you that i thought that they overlooked you know so they go to get the next infinity stone and as they get there they're introduced to a guide um a, a a character that is going to show them the way to, to the stone uh, and reveals what it requires to get the stone. But man, oh man, did I not expect that character to be the red skull? Oh yeah, dude, dude I dude, lost it. I lost me too. It. Like, because his story in captain America, the first Avenger, he was teleported away by the Tesseract. Cause he tried to wield it. Yeah, because he tried to wield it, and he got teleported away and appeared. And I was like, okay, so he's out there somewhere, right? Yes. And I just thought, you know, like a lot of people, that he was just dead. You know, like, people thought that he was just dead. And I'm sitting back here, and I'm like, yeah, he's out there somewhere. We're going to see him again to some level. And it just goes to show the careful care that they put into the movie and the cinematic universe 
that that they they brought him back and finished up his story and said, yes, I was teleported away by the Tezzerat when I tried to wield the Infinity Stone, and I came here to this stone, and the cost was too great for me. I could not achieve it. So I I have been tasked with guarding the stone forever. You know, it's just one of those little nuanced things. And yeah. through their through their interaction, Thanos learns that he has to sacrifice the thing that he loves the most to be able to wield the soul stone. And Gamora laughs because she knows that that he, ha- he she believes that he has to sacrifice himself because he loves nothing more than himself. And we find out that that's not the case. And that once again, Thanos does have a heart. And it, it, the line, the line that really emphasizes that is whenever she basically, she doesn't make, she's not making fun of him, but you know, she sees Thanos crying. And like you said, she believes that, you know, you love yourself. So you gotta, you know, you gotta kill yourself. And it's when the red skull interrupts and he says, those tears aren't for him. Yeah. That's what he says. And then like, that's when, you know, her pupils become huge and she's in shock. Go on. Yeah. Because he's got a Thanos loves Gamora more than anything else. And he, (laughs) Thanos does what he needs to do. And that's what Thanos is, is known for. And he grabs Gamora and he sacrifices her by throwing her down into the pit where the infinity stone is said to lie. Yeah, and before she's even um, thrown off of the cliff, she actually takes she actually takes the knife that she was given whenever she was a little girl by Thanos when he first captures her planet, and uh, you know basically releases genocide upon her people. But he gives yeah. her this uh, knife about balance, and you know, and it's like this double edged knife. Well, it's a perfectly actually, balanced blade and stuff. Yeah, yeah. she tries to. You know, she tries to impale herself in the gut with it, but right as she does it, of course, with the power of the reality you know, gem, reality, yeah. the reality gem, he of course makes it disappear, and then yeah, it turns it into bubbles, arm, and he yeah. throws her off. And I mean, right after this, I mean, he, you can tell Thanos is bothered because later on in the film, he does, uh, he has visions of her as a little girl. You know, Mm -hmm. speaking to him and whatnot, you can tell he's actually really hurt. But again, like he had told her before he thrown off the cliff, he missed this opportunity once before and he wasn't going to do it again. So nuts. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely crazy. Of course, he's whatever it takes. He wakes up. He wakes up in uh, what he will do, whatever it takes to get the, the infinity stones, because he's got a goal that is driving him. You know, he believes Four down, the, two to go. Yeah, four down, two to go. Yes. But he 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 basically has something that he gives that he is striving toward. And he is he, it's, it's it's so wonderfully written that he's got this ideal that he's striving towards uh, and that, that is not going to stop him at the even at the, the destruction of his own soul. Yeah, which is absolutely insane because we don't we don't think that oftentimes when things get difficult for us all or we start to destroy ourselves to entertain this idea, we stop. And it just goes to show that Thanos has the, the uh, determination to, to do what is required in his belief structure. Yeah. So it's just a deep, it's a, it's a deep meta physical conversation within Thanos's character as well to show that he will do anything to get this power. Yeah, yeah. literally anything. Literally anything to get this <clears> power. <throat> so, so he wakes up and he's in the he's in Wall and this the stone presents itself to him and he moves on to conquer the next conquest. And uh right before that next conquest, we go right back to Thor and on his journey with Rocket and Groot on creating a weapon that he can wield to defeat the likes of Thanos. So, or did we already go over this? Nope. No, we didn't. Oh, no, we didn't? Okay, yeah, so... Um, when they get to the forge. Yeah, so now uh, we go in on Thor, Rocket, and Groot on their adventure. 
uh, where Thor and them venture out to a forge that just so happens to be powered by an actual star. Yeah. Um, it's very Saturn like. It's got these uh, metallic rings that uh, encompass it, but of course the forge isn't lit. It's, you know, it's pretty much dead. And when they get there, they come across one of the dwarves that um, helped create Molnir. And uh, this hey, is let's really- be honest. Let's be honest. It's Peter freaking Dinklage. It's Peter yeah. Dinklage. It's Peter freaking Dinklage in I, I, an Infinity War movie. I popped really, really hard when I was like, wait a second. Is that Peter Dinklage? <laughs> right? Like, I, I'm sitting there with two of my two of my great friends, uh, Cody and Gavin, uh, that we were watching um, Game of Thrones together. And, like, we, we see Peter Dinklage and we just look at each other and we're like, Peter Dinklage, Peter Dinklage. Like it was, I just couldn't believe that he was in this film because I had no idea that they were going to. And he's a giant. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yep. So he's one of the dwarves of uh, Nidvillir. And he tells Thanos, I mean, he tells Thor that, well, I, I mean, actually, before well, yeah. he even tells them, they come across this hint that there was this mold of the gauntlet there. So it turns out, that this dwarf, Peter Dinklage's dwarf, I forget even what his name is, but he indeed admits that Thanos approached him and basically just like he has done yeah. so far, he says, you know, um, I'll spare make all these or people. Keep- yep. I'll spare all these people if you make me an artifact that can wield all the power st- or all the infinity stones. And he does so. And we're actually told by him, which I mean, what so far Thanos has spared people in circumstances like this. You give me the Tazerak Loki, I'll spare Thor's life, you know. Um, and then, of course, when we get to Tony in the Doctor Strange part, but um, he actually obliterated, just destroyed uh, the other dwarves, but he left yep. the dwarf who made him the gauntlet. And in doing so, he also casted the dwarf's hands so that he wasn't able to craft anything for anybody else and says that, you know, the next thing you make anything, it's going to be only for me. You make only things for me. Um, So long, long story short, um, they power the star up. They Thor basically anchors himself to the ship that him Groot and uh, rocket came in on. Uh, anchors himself to that, and they use the power of the rocket to help steer the rings around to reignite the star. Right. And then in doing so, it turns out that the uh, valve that the light that the light actually uh, siphons through uh, from the star, the heat that comes from the star is actually closed, and someone has to hold it open. So Thor actually goes to possibly sacrifice himself. And that's an iconic shot that you see in the trailers where he's uh, grabbing on one handle on the other side and one on the other. It's like he's like flexing or, you know, he's but he's pulling these two uh, handles together so he can open this valve so that the heat, the light, the fire from the star itself can make its way to the cast, to the mold that will make this new hammer for him. And they succeed. Um but in doing so, it has caused a, a lot of damage to we're we're talking Thor gets pretty much seared. He gets pretty much fried. He's fried chicken. He's laying there. He's about dead. And this is the moment. This is the uh, the character arc, the very little character arc of Groot and seeing him grow maturely because he's still uh, what playing space invaders on a handheld or something like that. Yeah. Um, so he can more so not give a crap. When Groot realizes of the sacrifice that Thor is making and understands that this weapon is very, very important to him, Groot decides to put down the game and he uses his vine to actually put the mul- the the two pieces of the hammer together. And it just so happens that um, Groot's the, the handle to the hammer becomes Groot's vines or his arm. Right. And let's talk about that. Let's, let's talk about how hilarious 
teenager Groot is. Like, oh, man, God. I gotta say, like that. It's just such a moment where he's he's so cocky and arrogant, just like a teenager would be. Yeah. And he's just like, uh, he just does this sacrificial moment where he grabs what is more important and puts things down and does what is necessary and cuts off his own arm. I mean, it'll grow back, of course, but he cuts off his own arm and wields the the gives Thor this new axe. It's just so awesome. It absolutely is. And so in doing so, finally, now Thor, you know, wielded the new hammer, the Stormbreaker, um, which I think back in comic books, uh, Odin actually was the one who crafted the Stormbreaker and he gave it to a better Ray Bill. But that's n- neither here or there. Yeah. So. Right in doing when doing this, what has happened as as this was happening, we have Bruce Banner, Captain America, Scarlet Witch, you know, that group with um Black Widow and Vision, who I uh, mean Vision is basically their protected cargo. Um, one of the things that's emphasized in this movie that I notice is the theme is soul for soul. And we don't trade lives because vision, of course, just, you know, like Shill has stated, vision knows that Scarlet Witch is gifted with so much power that she can destroy the stones. And he even says, you have to sacrifice me. You, you, you just got to, even if it kills me, you got to do it before you. And no one agrees upon that. Even Captain America says we don't trade lives. We're not going to do that. Right. So they decide the only place they can resolve this issue and possibly, if any chance, separate the Mind Stone from Vision and also keep Vision intact and keep him alive is to you know, go to Wakanda. So they travel to Wakanda and they meet with Black Panther and everything. And it's Black Panther. It's T'Challa, Black Panther's sister who basically is going to perform this extraction right. of the mind. She, she basically tells them that it's an easy task. I'll have this done, you know? Yeah. And that, that within the hour. <laughs> yeah. And that, I mean, she's on a different scale. Even Bruce Banner is so dumbfounded and he's like, Oh yeah. Why didn't we do that? Why didn't we do this very simple solution? Yeah. Cause you we know? didn't think of it. <laughs> yeah. Cause we didn't think of it, but, um, so Right as they're doing that, of course, Wakanda is found and it is invaded by the Black Order, as well as these very primal, dude, forearm, two-legged, s- straight up, dude. Those are those are vandals from Destiny. Like I sat back and I was like, those are those are vandals. <laughs> <laughs> those are vandals from Destiny. Like crossover <laughs> confirmed. Yeah. yeah. So the the whole battle sequence happens, um, and. You, they they basically crash land on these pyramid like spike things, you know, and Proxima Midnight and the Black Dwarf, the big guy, um, you know, they basically make their statement on how they're not giving up and they're going to get to Vision no matter what it takes. Right. And so those rabid, would you call them vandals? Yeah, that's what I, mean. that's what I call these them. These rabid <laughs> vandal like creatures, um, they release them and they actually push so hard you know through the barrier the shield that surrounds wakanda that they're actually sacrificing themselves and pushing each other through just so that they can get to um the avengers and the people of wakanda and how of like how powerful is it to see that again when we go back to the story of the black panther and the different tribes to see um Who's the Gorilla King? Who's that guy again? Do we remember uh, his name? Yeah, but his people are joining... I hated his, that movie. <laughs> dude, I love that movie. His people, of course, are joining forces with, you know, the Black Panther tribe. And they're all doing it just to save one life. And that being Visions. Yep. Nothing else. They are doing it to just for the sole purpose of saving his well, life. Extracting the, I mean... Well, extracting I, his, no, yeah. destroying the stone. But they have to save his life. You know, right, I mean, right. even, I mean, otherwise they would just rip that thing out. Well, if they let him die. all of the stones, that's, yeah. that's the, the underlying that's, theme. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, uh, so what happens is you're led to believe that Corvus, 
um, one of the alien dudes who was injured by the Black Widow is actually dead. And Proxima Midnight basically makes that believable by stating, you know, that he won't be joining us. You know, kind of like stating he is dead. He is not. So as this battle goes on, uh, let's just say this much. It gets to a point where the Avengers and the people of Wakanda are overwhelmed by these vandals. Bruce Banner is in the Hulkbuster, and uh, he's still trying to bring the Hulk out, and he just keeps prematuring, and he just can't get the Hulk to come back out. A very Yeah, uh, let's talk about that. I think that is entirely because Hulk got beat. Oh, it is. Yeah, Yeah. he's scared. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like he doesn't want to come out because they they don't they don't actually say anything about it in the film. But I think that's entirely because Hulk got beat and he had to this point had never been beaten. Nope. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And it's I think the answer to that is going whenever the rest of the characters get together. Or wait, never mind. Is uh, Mantis still alive by the end of this? No. Okay, never mind. Um, but still going on, and I'll get to that part. What I thought was going to happen. So yeah, right let's here. let's summarize. Let's fin- let's finish yeah. up the, the battle here. So Scarlet Witch intersects herself into the battle because she sees that they're losing, yeah. right? So she she goes out to protect the Vision, or to to protect the rest of the Avengers, and doing so leaves the Vision vulnerable. And once she's in there, the the uh, the Black Order recognizes that and sends their assassin to get the infinity stone from the vision. So that stops the process of extracting the stone from the vision. And when that happens, the vision goes and puts himself back out on the battlefield. They were so close of removing that Nintendo power gauntlet from him. The Nintendo power gauntlet. Right. (laughs) So yeah. So that's the plan they come up with. They, they come up with this, this great idea of restraining Thanos and making sure he's unable to to harness the power of the Infinity Gauntlets, because Doctor Strange has looked at 14 million different outcomes by by gazing at time using the the Infinity Stone uh, and looking at like 14 million different outcomes. And asks Tony asks, and how many of those do we win? And Doctor Strange says one, <laughs> one. Yeah, yeah. So that's a pretty critical moment as well. Um, so Thanos interjects and, and starts fighting everyone. And as they go to remove the gauntlet, um, Peter Quill comes up and asks Thanos, as they have him restrained, where is Gamora? And man, Peter Quill in Peter Quill fashion does what he's <clears throat> best, finds out that, that Gamora has been has been killed thanks to Mantis. Because Mantis is up on his shoulders, basically. Trying to keep, in his mind, yes. Mantis keep is him really calm and keep him passed out. Yes. And she reveals that Thanos sacrificed Gamora, and Peter Quill loses his cool and starts attacking Thanos, and in doing so, releases the grip that everyone has on him. And I gotta tell you guys, when he loses his cool and Thanos gets unhinged, I'm just sitting there and I'm like, Peter Quill, you moron. Yep. Right? Like, I'm in it and I'm like, you moron. So Thanos gets loose because of this this overreaction from Quill. And, man, he just he just lays waste to all of them. And He lays, he lays so much waste that he actually, with the power of the gauntlet, grabs a hold of a moon that's floating above Titan, and he throws it down on the yeah. Avengers. <laughs> and throws it at the Avengers. It's so crazy. It's so, like, wow. Like, yeah. That's, that's how powerful he is. Go on. Yep. So he, he does this whole process. They fight through this moon, and at the end of it, he stabs Tony. And as he does, Tony's not dead. He hasn't killed him. Doctor Strange decides that in this moment that he's going to give up the Time Stone to Thanos if he spares Tony's life. And we've seen that we've seen that honor from Thanos before where he is. He can be a man of his word. And he and Doctor Strange probably saw that well. And he gives up the Time Stone and Thanos spares Tony and uh and immediately teleports to Earth. And the big question 
from Tony is why why would you do that? And Doctor Strange says it's because we're in the end game now. And he, but right before that, he says it was the only way, Tony. Yep, it was the only way. So Thanos teleports back to Earth. The Avengers are at head. They start fighting Thanos. They they now recognize that Vision is is a big threat to them, and Thanos is after Vision, so they're trying to protect them. While Scarlet Witch makes that sacrifice, you know she has na- she now has to make the sacrifice and destroy the vision and the infinity stone and everyone's powering through trying to keep Thanos from the infinity stone. And she succeeds in destroying the, infi- the, the gem before Thanos gets to it. Mm-hmm. And man, in such a, in such a Thanos way, he, he says, he basically says, all right, well that was, cool. and uh, using the time gem, rewinds time, brings the vision and the infinity stone back to life and then rips it out of vision's head and kills the vision and has all six infinity stones. Mm-hmm. And every Thor single sh- one. Yep. Every single one. Every Thor single shows- one. Thor shows up. Yeah. Yep. Thor shows up. Uh, you know, he does his battle cry through the air and he throws the storm breaker like he just heaves it with all his might down upon uh, Thanos. And again, this is another time. This is like the second time you thought Thanos was actually dying or going to die. And Thanos tries to basically reflect it with the power of the gauntlet, but the actual, the Stormbreaker itself actually just cuts through this power beam by the infinity gauntlets and actually successfully hits and stabs and pales Thanos right in the chest and Thor yeah. basically comes down and says, this is for, you know, this is for Loki. This is for all the people that you killed. Um, yep. You know, I told you I would, I would kill you. I'd come back to kill you. And he even, he even grabs a hold of Thanos's shoulder and like uses his own chest to push the, uh, yeah. The back and the blunt part of the hammer, the ax into Thanos's chest and Thanos is gasping and he you kind of get this like idea that he's about to you know his I don't know the the the, the, the movie about, makers of this movie just did an awesome job at really yeah because I was like you think like, that I can't die I mean I think yeah you think that they're gonna it, succeed it made me believe he was gonna die there yeah like, and on his dying breath he then like says you should have aimed for the oh, head man what a moment. Not, Always aim for the head. But here, again, just like it has been stated countless times through the movie, whether it's by Gamora or Doctor Strange or anybody, at the snap of his fingers, like just like that, he snaps his fingers with the gauntlet, and boom, half of the population is absolutely gone. Yep. And we see some of our most loved characters, beloved characters, Gone. I mean, who all who all got wiped out? Oh man, going through the list. Um, let's just start with all of the Guardians of the Galaxy except for Rocket. Yeah, those are all gone. Uh, Falcon. Yep, Falcon's yeah. gone. War There's Machine Bucky. is gone. Um, Bucky. Bucky's gone. Yeah, Bucky's gone. Um, man, Bucky's gone. Uh, Spider Man is gone. That was the um, most powerful. That, that was I me too. Was it was a 30 days of night. If anyone has seen, seen 30 days of night, the end of that is just absolutely impactful. It's a good movie. Go out and watch it. Um, but Peter states that he doesn't feel good. And Tony just keeps trying to reassure him. And it was very son to father, like father to son, like, yeah, well, they've and, created that dynamic. between. Yeah, and Tony just loves Peter and he just tells him, no, no, no it's okay. It's okay. Nothing, nothing's wrong. And Peter just falls into Tony's arms, like holding him and he starts crying and he starts saying that he's scared and he just wants to go back home and stuff. And then he lays him down and he just dissipates in Tony's arms. And it was just, uh, it it was very, very emotional. Um, I, there was people crying in the theater. There were were people behind me who were teary eyed. I, uh, I'll say this. Um, I got that like really hard thud in my throat. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, right before the lacrimal ducks start to release. So I was, I was just about there, dude. I so many characters are dead now. 
Um, Dude, even Black basically Panther. every everyone from Wakanda is basically dead. Yeah, Black, <laughs> Pan- Black Panther, Mantis, Bucky, Doctor Strange, yep. and Star Lord all turned to ash. Yep, all gone. It's we're it's basically ridiculous. left with we're basically left with the original Avengers. Yeah, you're right. We're ba- that's basically where we are at this point. Um, with you know, uh, e- even Scarlet Witch is dead. Um, you know, there's so ma- there's so much death in this movie, and Thanos does it all with the snap of his fingers. And so let's let's wrap it up. Uh, Thanos does what he says he's going to do, sits and watches the sunset, and that's how the film ends. You know. Yep. Um, that's, that's the end of it. Cause Captain America says, someone says, what are we going to do? And they don't have an answer. And Thanos watches a sunset and the movie's over. Right. And then we hit that post credit scene where we see Nick Fury with, uh, Maria, Maria Hill, Hill. And they're just talking about whether or not, whether or not they've heard for, about Tony coming back yet. And, uh, as the process goes through, we see what's happening in the real world with the people disappearing, right? We see cars that are spiraling off the road because people were driving them that have now disappeared. We see a helicopter crash into a building uh, because it's being unmanned. We, um, we, we see all of the, the real world effects of what has taken place. And we see several other people dissipate, including Maria Hill. And um, Nick Fury says that he's going to make the call. And, uh, as he's stumbling, trying to do so, he pulls out this little, uh, I don't know, this little communicator and presses a button on it. And <laughs> it's called a pager. Uh, it's a, yeah. Oh, it's called a page. <laughs> <It's> called- <laughs> <laughs> so he pulls out a pager and, uh, as he, as he does and he makes the call, he as well dissipates and drops the pager onto the ground. And we see the Captain Marvel symbol. Yep. So Captain Marvel is being summoned, and we we know that they have a Captain Marvel movie in the works. Uh, it must be here. coming out this year. So it must be one of those ideas that they're going to um, continue telling the story through the other movies because there's still Ant Man coming out as well. There's still uh, Captain Marvel. Um, yeah, which is a movie that's taking place in the '90s. And yep. Nick That's Fury why it's a will, Yep. And Nick Fury will be heavily involved in this. Oh movie. wow. Okay, cool. That's gonna be really Which awesome. I think I think this is kind of, of course that's what's going to show the relevance, the connection between the two, because I mean right now it's like what what are the connection between the two? But mm-hmm. um I know Ronan the Accuser is gonna be in it in Captain okay. Marvel again. Um right. and what else? It, it, this is during the Cree and I think the um, Chikari War, which the Chikari were the alien race in Avengers. Um, I think it's taking place between those two races. And um, I, I think we're going to get some backstory on what exactly happened to Nick Fury, his eye, all that kind of stuff. Oh, that's going to be neat. So, yeah, that's that's the movie in a nutshell, man. And uh, how do you how do you guys feel about this movie? Uh, my initial, like, so the showing that I've seen was opening night, Thursday night. It was only the second showing in, in our town here. And there wasn't that many people. There was only like maybe 10 of us, to be honest with you. But, uh, so like it was at 10 15. So the end of the movie is at like one o'clock in the morning. So I, I was like trying to process it all, but I was way too tired. But, uh, all in all, obviously it's a great film. I'm trying to think what all they even say. I, I mean, there's so many deaths at the end that it's hard to really, or it was hard for me to really feel emotion. Uh, if that makes sense. Like, it was just like, wow, just everybody's dying. Yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously Peter Parker was obviously the, the biggest, uh, you know, sad moment just mm-hmm. cause I've, I've been a lifelong Spider-Man fan and just in one movie, I already, really liked the, you know, Tom Holland's portrayal of Spider-Man. And uh, so like, I, that's honestly my, my biggest disappointment as a fan is like, man, now we're probably not going to get much Spider-Man in the next part of this. Cause essentially it is part one and part two, even though they don't call them that now, but uh, yeah, I just great movie all in all. I don't 
won the weight a year. <laughs> It'll be the longest year since uh, the That's Rock the and John Cena, you know, announced a match that we had to wait a year for. <laughs> you know, we yes. cared about. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's going to be a long year. Hopefully, Ant Man's awesome. Hopefully, Captain Marvel's awesome. Ant Ant Man and the Wasp will be great. Um, I, I was genuinely. Uh, thrilled about the first Ant Man. I didn't. I went into it like I'm like uh, Paul Rudd, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I, I was I was very pleased with that first movie. So I can't imagine so that the second I, one. The second I love one, that movie. Yeah. It it was so, a rushed movie too, and it yeah. turned out fantastic. Yeah, it um, did. It, it kind of makes me wonder though, like how Ant Man and Wasp is going to play into this. Is I'm assuming this is something that happens directly before. The Infinity yeah. War, you know what I mean? I would imagine. And is there anything in that movie that's going to connect it to? I, I'm hearing a lot of theories. Um, I guess let's let's talk about what we could possibly see. In well, I, the I wanna, part. well, before we do that, before okay. we do, that, I want to know how you feel about the about what overall, just overall about how you feel about the movie. Um, I think I think the movie, uh, honestly. And um, this isn't an overstatement. This isn't an understatement. It, the movie's fantastic, everybody, especially if you've been a fan of majority of these films or you are a comic book fan. Um, I I give kudos to the Russo brothers for writing this film because, again, uh, like Shill had stated, this movie does jump back and forth um, from you know four different perspectives throughout the whole movie. But in turn, it still keeps everybody's it, the, the movie still maintains the storyline still maintains everybody's character arc or their character development throughout the film, their journey. So in these four groups, it, I think the film really succeeds in doing that. I didn't necessarily get um, confused at all whatsoever. Uh, me personally, I didn't mind the um you know, I didn't mind the subtitle at the bottom when it introduced a new world. Um, and I think there was some hit or misses because I totally agree with you. Um, if writers can't um, basically identify the setting, the location that they're in through the dialogue of the characters, um, they're really not doing a good job. However, I think for the most part, I would say they're eight for 10 on doing that in this movie. Yeah, I really liked, I think it was okay. Yeah, yeah. I really liked a lot of um, the character chemistry. I really oh, yeah. liked the budding heads, the, the battle of the minds between Tony Stark, who is a science sophisticated guy, and then Dr. Doctor Strange, who, again, sees the world in the world of magic and the magical arts Mm -hmm. Um, to see them butt heads and everything. It was great. I thought there was just enough humor in the movie, especially between those two. Um, I can recall, I think the funniest moment, the moment that I broke out the most in is they find humor in some of the most serious moments. And there's a moment when Tony, Peter, and Doctor Strange appear on Titan, and they are ambushed by the Guardians. <laughs> and the whole, the whole thing that perpetuates um, the Guardians of the Galaxy attacking these three is because they think that Tony, Peter, and Doctor Strange are aligned with um, Thanos. So, a Quill, who's really pissed off Star Lord, he keeps asking him, and they basically get into a standstill where I, th- yeah, Peter Quill has a hold of Peter Parker and he's pointing the gun to his head and Iron Man's pointing the gun at uh, Peter and um, Drax asks, Dra- what master do you, use? or yeah. no, yeah, no, 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 it goes, it's not Drax. It goes, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Dr. Strange, I think asks. What master do you serve? Yeah. And Peter Quill says, what the hell am I supposed to say? This? <laughs> yeah, that that part was good. And then right after that, Peter Quill just keeps demanding, where's Gamora? Where's Gamora? So right on the last time he asks, where's Gamora? Then Tony responds with, um, or yeah, where's Gamora? He responds with, who's Gamora? And then as, as Drax is there about getting, he's about to get impaled. I forget who it's by. Uh, who has a hold of him and has a knife or like a, a scepter to his neck. 
But then Ray, as he's about like on the brisk of possibly dying, he's really like, I've got one better. Why Gamora? Why <laughs> Gamora? <laughs> Who's Gamora? Where is Gamora? I got one better. Why, Why Gamora? Gamora? Oh, and then the, the, that interaction where he says, um, what after he says, what am I supposed to say? Jesus. Tony Stark goes, you're from Earth? And <laughs> Quill goes, I'm from Missouri. And <laughs> Stark goes, that's on Earth, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> There was such... The, the character interactions, uh, again, uh, I think just flourished. They were amazing. Um, I think they did the best they could and the best that anyone could on pairing the right characters with one another, again, to help propel their story arcs. And it just it made overall sense. Um, I think one of the biggest letdowns, honestly, is Captain America in right, this movie. Yeah. Um, he didn't shine in this movie. No. And no. again, we can leave the next movie to that, but um, I'll tell well, you who I, stood I, out I, more I know than why. Anything. Why? I kind of know why. Because there was so much focus in Civil War because it was a Captain America movie, which True. I have a hard time remembering sometimes because it's essentially just Avengers. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I think that's why we don't get as much spotlight on him. You know, we get more spotlight on Iron Man, obviously. Right, because he doesn't have the movies. I, Iron Man hasn't had an act yeah. in, what, 10 movies almost. You know? Something, yeah. Yeah, he's just had little cameos here and there. And he doesn't really have a huge spotlight shown on him during the Civil War movie either. We right. just see We just see his decisions in Civil War. We don't really see Tony's character yeah. change the way that it's changing in this movie. Right. Uh, in Civil War, we just see his decisions being. so Because the focus is on Cap and his team during that movie. But man, I, I loved this film. Right? Like, yeah. I, I just thought this was the best. I thought it was everything it needed to be. I've said over the past couple weeks that if this wasn't one of the greatest movies I'd ever seen, that I'm just checking out of the Marvel Universe. And, <laughs> man, I'm just happy Thanos got to snap his fingers and wipe out half the life on the universe. You know? Yeah. Because that's that's what I really wanted. I wanted him to succeed. I wanted him... The Avengers to lose. Yeah, I wanted the Avengers to lose because they do. Yeah. Right? They, they The comic book adaptation of this story that they're telling which they've they've gone so far away from the comic book that that you know that that they're there's no way that they're going to come back to it at all but yeah. in the con- comic book adaptation Thanos snaps his fingers and wipes out half the universe like he just does it you know and he succeeds in it and these marvel movies have one of the big criticisms is that we haven't had a great to uh that that can can be resurrected throughout the series. You know what yeah. I mean? Like Red Skull making his return was amazing. I'm I'm happy that he did that. Uh Loki and his character development throughout the series has been great. Um but those are the real those have been the real villains, the best villains. And yeah. you know, we've had we've had folks, we've had stories that have been told that we can't even remember the name of the villain. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. t- tell me who the villain from, uh, from the, the I don't know, the second Iron Man was. You know, like we know that because it's Whiplash, and uh, we know the comic book background. But like you say that to the casual Marvel, fan, they have no clue. You know, and it, it, because it's been irrelevant, those characters were there just to tell a little bit of a story, and now we have Thanos, this big bad baddie, and he wins. Yeah. yeah, and it's just great. It's just great storytelling because now we've got a we've got a, a, a basically a god that needs to yep. be overthrown. Yep, it's going to be amazing. So, with that said, can we get into on our predictions of the second film? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, my biggest question is how seed, uh, and I think that one of the ways that they're going to do that is. Um, with Captain Marvel, obviously. Yeah, um, definitely, you're right. Captain Marvel's going to play a critical role. I'm not too familiar on his superpowers, though. I'm not familiar on his character. Her. Oh, her. Because Cap- Captain Marvel was a Kree, all right? Um, 
Yeah, I, I See, more that's so, how unfamiliar I am with it. Yeah, yeah. Basically, um, Captain Marvel, from what I understand, um, the original was a Kree who was kind of humanoid, pretty much. He was pretty much human like, and he was gifted with uh, these superpowers and kind of just like the Green Lantern. Um, I believe, yeah, she was a pilot and she. Uh, Brie Larson's uh, character or, you know, the, the Captain Marvel, the lady, um, I forget her real name, um, but she basically comes across um, him and is gifted with his power after he passes. So that's what makes her the new Captain Marvel. Okay. But well, awesome. I think, I think too, Captain Marvel is obviously going to be someone who's very detrimental because from what I understand, on a scale of like power, Captain Marvel is indeed one of the most powerful um, characters in the Marvel universe. Um, how they, I, and I think that's what they're going with here in this Marvel Cinematic Universe as well. Is that obviously um, it's taking Nick Fury to whip out this huge pager and page um, Captain Marvel um, for obviously an SOS help. Yeah. Well, it's going to be incredibly interesting. I, I, I genuinely have no idea what direction they go in, right? Because I didn't, I didn't read the Infinity War book. Yeah. Um, I, uh, so this is my hang up, and I, I just have no clue where they're going to go. Um, because I, I genuinely thought that Doctor Strange was going to live, uh, and I thought that he was going to be critical to the to them overcoming Thanos, and they threw that out the window for me. So I, I genuinely have. No how it's going to happen. Yeah. I'm kind of in the same boat. Uh, I don't know much about what's going on. I just hope Spider-Man comes back to life. Yeah. Right. Like, (laughs) are they going to resurrect heroes? Like, is that going to be? I think so. I mean, again, they'll probably be at the end of the next movie. Like they'll somehow they'll use the power of the time stone or something. Yeah. And go back in time and maybe defeat Thanos somehow or something. Who knows? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I was talking to. I, I think it was you. Uh, I think that you said that the Tony Stark might go all the way back in time to the beginning, or maybe it was a different friend that I saw the movie with. But uh, uh, Tony Stark might use the gauntlet and go back all the way to the beginning of the the uh, the Avengers movie, or even further back and. Just kill Thanos. Yeah. So, I mean, hey, was or, it just was it just me, or did the Infinity Stone break? Yes, the Infinity Stone broke. She did break the Infinity Stone. No, 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 no. I mean, when he snapped his fingers, or am I just? No, no. He's still. Got, right I now? I believe he's still got all that. Yeah. He okay. Still has that. Yeah. Let me uh, let me tell you some of the things that um, I'm thinking. Um, where the story could lead to and some of the things that I've discussed with other people on this movie, if you don't mind. Um, Again, we don't have a Hawkeye and we do not see Hank Pym in this movie. Um, But from what I understand, they are in the next movie. Uh, There's possibility that, because again, people think time travel is going to be the big thing in the next movie um, that they're going to have to go back in time. And me thinking, I think the only way they can do that is if they get a hold of the time gem. But here there, I guess was a story arc back in Marvel comics where um, Hank Pym or, you know, uh, Dr. Lang did make a time machine to go back in time. So is there a possibility that maybe we see towards Ant-Man and uh, Wasp, which I believe the uh, villain is Ghost, that maybe um, maybe there's some type of device or something that they're after that supposedly can help uh, create a time portal or help go back in time? I don't know. Um, that is a possibility. Um, I don't think that's going to happen, but that is a possibility. I still think Captain America is not Captain America. Even <laughs> you're still even, convinced of that. I am still convinced, especially especially with the timing of this movie and then Captain Marvel coming out. I think Captain Marvel comes out next and then the next Infinity War movie or Secret War, whatever you want to call it. 
I am still convinced that Captain America is not Captain America. I still believe that he is a Cree in disguise. And what will help make that relevant, what will help us make that connection is indeed the Captain Marvel movie when we see the Cree against the uh, Chikari and uh, seeing the ability of the Cree to basically morph into whoever they want. I don't know, man. I, when Th- okay, look at Thanos, how he, okay. Thanos fought Hulk, correct? And he fought with the gauntlet on with maybe the stone. Now, not discrediting Thanos and his boxer-like skills, but I mean, I still think he would have been able to easily take on Hulk even without that power gem on him. I don't even mm-hmm. think he used a fraction of its power. Well, Anyhow, either. think about how much of a punch it takes. Like, the impact, the, the, the pounds per square inch, the raw power of Thanos' punches in that he puts into Thor. I mean, he puts into, yeah, even Thor, but even he puts into Hulk to put him down. You're telling me that Thanos, with a with all the power gems, the full gauntlet, pretty much close to it, is going to punch at uh, Captain America and let back, and Captain America is just so going to have godlike power or some type of power that he's going to be able to stop the punch of Thanos? I mean, either... Either the creators of this film are doing a really bad job on the, I mean, Captain America, he's very powerful. He's a super soldier. I understand that. I, I even believe the fact that, yeah, he can keep a, uh, he can keep a helicopter from lifting, you know, away from a helicopter pad. Like, you know, I can, I can believe that it's Captain America. He can most certainly do that. But you're telling me he's gonna, he is going to uh, deflect or hold back a punch from Thanos, the very, the very, uh, you know, fist that wields the gauntlet itself. There's something there, man. And was it a look of concern that, oh my gosh, this human is actually like holding, holding me back? Or is it something more than that? And that's where I really do think that Captain America, again, is not Captain America. I think they're going to take that from the comics. And I think it's going to turn out the whole time that Captain America has been dead. And it's been a Cree this whole time. I don't think so. But, but, but you know. But again, I, I, what I think would you're the, stretching. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what would the, the Crees, um, I guess the big thing is, what would the Crees... Um, reason being behind doing that yeah i think you're just i think you're too wrapped up in 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 swerves (laughs) but dude i love them (laughs) swerves i absolutely love them swerves i think we can all agree that again dr strange indeed this this is the path they had to take he saw himself giving up that stone that's why he's giving up that stone yeah tony tony was likely alive in the only timeline that he saw that they won yeah so Tony's going to have some major role to play in the in the defeating of Thanos. Yeah. Yep. One thing I want to touch base on is the connection between Tony Stark and Thor. I mean, not Thor, but Thanos. And Thanos basically calls Tony by his name, Tony. And yeah, he knows Tony's who like, he is. Yeah, and he says, you know who I am? And he's like, indeed, I know who you are. Now, there's some people who are just speculating that, oh, well, you know, Loki being a servant of Thanos there during the first Avengers, he, of course, informed Thanos of all the Avengers, all their names. Um, Other people, of course, are saying different, you know, maybe somehow, some way Thanos is indeed the uh, the source that is giving um, Tony these nightmares but I don't know I don't think it's that either I honestly don't know what it is and it's not clarified and I hope it is clarified on how or why well, there's a reason that that line took place right yeah. it's, it's there are these nuanced things that have taken place in the cinematic universe that have not been insignificant right there's there's a significant reason that that line is there um, we don't know what it is yet and but I'm sure that it will be evolved and hashed out through the next series of movies. Yeah. Premature Hulk. 
it's inevitable <laughs> he's going to be coming out in the next <laughs> film without a doubt in our minds. Um, do you think this is become this is going to be because of self revelation and him talking sense into his alter ego Hulk that hey our friends have died and whatnot you need to you need to help. Um, do you think it's going to be a self revelation type of thing and then Hulk comes out or do you think? See, my whole thing was I thought Mantis was going to be the key to Hulk coming out. There was going to be some chemistry. She was going to be brought back some way, somehow, and she would be the one that would help Banner focus. And this movie is soul for soul. We don't trade lives. So is there a possibility? Because we already know that Chris Evans wants to. He's he's done. I don't know, man. If, If Chris Evans was done, hear me out on this. If Chris Evans was done, they would have killed him. Well, no, they filmed they filmed the two movies together. What? Oh, they, the Infinity Wars. Yeah, they they filmed both parts of this movie together in one big, you know, long production. So they're done filming it. It's you know they just got to do post, you know they just got to do uh, post production stuff and basically put it out there. But Chris Evans has said his goodbye. Uh, whether he's tricking us or not, I think he is done. But this leads me to believe this is where we will see the soul for a soul thing again um, emphasized. uh, In the second film, yeah, might sacrifice himself for something. For Bucky, Um, Tony might give himself up. Uh, In what way? In in what um, you know critical moment? And what criteria would it make the characters do this? I don't know, but there are people who are speculating there's going to become a moment where uh, a passing of the mantle where maybe Iron Man and Captain America both agree to basically trade their lives, trade themselves for the the people who had been taken away. So Tony would trade himself for Peter and Captain America would trade himself for Bucky uh, so on and so forth. And then that would be, that would create the new Avengers to say, I don't know if it would necessarily come to that point um, where, you know, they get a hold of a soul gem or they go to somebody who can interact with it and, you know, they possibly trade lives. Um, does the red skull, does he, is he going to make a reappearance or is it that this is the end for him? And that I think that's the end for him. I think that's the end. I I'm comfortable with it being glad they parents and he's, I mean, he said in it that he is, that he was lorded over guiding people to the stone mm-hmm. so i think i think that's the end for him yeah yeah i agree so man i loved this movie so much yeah it but was I again it was fantastic josh brolin as thanos um, yeah I, I couldn't see it any other way i really think he captured it and again um Besides Killmonger, because up to this point before this movie, I thought Killmonger from Black Panther was the strongest villain. Uh, Marvel has been known. For really? Having, yeah, dude. I, I honestly think so. I think I think a lot of the Marvel Cinematic Universe villains have been lackluster, um, with the exceptions of Loki. Um, I did like Ronan the Accuser, but however, I really did think he was weak. Again, um, the best villains. There's that- something, man, that I'm not getting from from Black Panther. There's just there's something that is hanging me up on that movie that everyone is so in love with, and I just I'm just sitting back and I'm like, man, that's not their strongest showing. You know, I thought I thought the Winter Soldier. Oh, the Winter Soldier's. I mean, besides this, Infinity War is my favorite now, but, um, you know, prior to this, Winter Soldier was my favorite. It was definitely their strongest, and it had one of the strongest villains. I think so, um, too, with Hydra. Um, yep. I think with Hydra um, being so secretive in the in the government and being a part of S.H.I.E.L.D. the whole time, I just thought that was the most powerful comeback and the most powerful villain that has existed Baron until Zemo. Thanos. Until yeah. Thanos, but yeah. I just I, I Killmonger to me just felt shallow. You know, he was really? just yeah, he was just an empty character full of resentment, but and that see, was it. I, that was see, it. His the, whole character was, oh, you killed my, you killed my dad. I'm gonna destroy. 
Yeah, but I think what makes him, again, uh, relevant, someone that you can... He was a character you could have some sympathy for. I mean, you look at that uh, scene where, as a kid, he sees that ship lift off of T'Challa's father as the Black Panther, and it just so happens that was his, you know, that that's his uncle. But he walks yeah. in on his dad, and his dad's dead there, lying on the floor. And as a child, he had been shared um, everything about Wakanda and whatnot. And he personally believes that it is a part of his birthright as well, you know, to have a chance upon that throne. And you killed my father, like there. That and the fact that he was an African American boy. Um, there's just in that day, you know, during that setting, that time. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. And I'm assuming that was like early 90s, late 80s when that scene happened. Right. So I have some sympathy uh, for Killmonger, that character. Um, and he's absolutely, again, ruthless. I think he's about as ruthless as, not as Thanos, but he's on, he's towards that tier of the scale. Right. Um, well, they're, they're, they're philosophical act. Um, ideologies are very similar um, yeah, exactly. because Killmonger Killmonger wanted to um, well Killmonger wanted to destroy the hierarchy so to say and um, lift up all of the African American people throughout the world and arm them and make them the new power yeah. uh, so it was a sort of revenge ideology whereas Thanos is just like I want balance so they're similar in that genocidal uh, approach, but Killmonger, um, he was more revenge driven where Thanos was just like uh, more sympathetic and was just like, hey, yeah, there's an unfair, there's an unfair advantage to certain folks because there's no balance and I'm going to create balance. So yeah, yeah so absolutely. Thanos, I mean- Thanos was random genocide, whereas Killmonger was was selected genocide. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely was. But um, yeah, Thanos Thanos is by far. And it, wouldn't it have been a shame if it turns out he wasn't a strong character? Like they just didn't make him a strong, like, um, likable villain. You know how yeah, much he uh, needed to be likable. Yeah, yeah, in the sense of being a very good villain, in which. He absolutely is. Um, I know there's rumors again circulating, and again, this could be you know again my swerve, uh, my hope for swerving and whatnot. But there, there are claims that Hugh Jackman was seen on multiple occasions. I heard that too. Of the production. Now hold on, like it makes me wonder that if there's involvement of time travel and whatnot, if we could possibly. We could possibly see Hugh Jack because Hugh Jackman did state that. He, I mean, he was done with the Logan character. He was done with Wolverine. However, if he could reprise the role, he would like it to be one where we actually see Wolverine in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think the chances are slim. Um, I think it is a possibility, especially with um, confirmations that yeah, he was indeed on the set. I think it would be nuts, but could we also see more characters? Like, uh, for instance, at the end of the Guardians of the Galaxy 2, uh, we see the capsule or the cocoon of Adam Warlock. Um, could Is this where Adam Warlock makes his... That's right, I forgot about that. Yeah, and in, in comic books, Adam Warlock has wielded the gauntlet before. I think, matter of fact, I think he was in Infinity War. The comic, I believe. I believe he is the one who wields it, and he's the most powerful beings as well. So, him and Captain Marvel, you know, Adam Warlock, Captain Marvel, you know, could those two and Tony be the key into defeating Thanos? There's a more pressing question, actually. What's that? Is Howard the Duck still alive? (laughs) What ducks? Howard the Duck. Oh, Howard the Duck. I said I, I said that to, to Gavin at the end of the film. I said, I hope the end credits scene has Howard the Duck in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, dude, so I'm, so I'm excited. There's still a, bunch, a lot more. We are in no greater of a position than uh, whenever we went into this movie. Um, 
we don't know what's coming. We don't, you know, we don't have any clue. And I'm, I'm genuinely excited, man. And it's just, I'm not checked out. I'm, I'm buying into the Marvel Cinematic, sticking to it. Oh yeah, most certainly. So, so what an awesome experience. Yep. And uh, again, everybody, spoiler: um, we could not go an episode without discussing this fantastic movie. Um, it'd be very ignorant of us if we didn't do that. I know we typically do video games and solely, mostly video games. Ignorant doesn't thing. mean rude. But he said, no. he said it'd be very ignorant of us. That means it would be very stupid of us. So there you go. There you go. Ow. Oh, Ow. Oh. It just means a lack of general knowledge. Pretty much. <laughs> okay. Well, anyhow, anyway. that's your Webster's <laughs> Dictionary definition for the day. And again, we are Geek Tavern Radio. Uh, we record here mostly every single Sunday. And again, you can catch us over at our... What's that Hickamber Jiggy thing called? Oh, you can follow us on Twitter by following us at Geek Tavern. You can interact with us and have a conversation through discord uh our discord link is pinned to our twitter we post it on facebook as well and we'll have it in the show notes at the bottom of the episode here as well so hop into that discord have conversations with us we can organize and play games together um dax where can they find you individually on twitter you can find me at dax amunder that's d-a-x-i-m-u-n-d-e-r you can find me on twitter mike bundy uh, you can find me on Twitter at Mike Bundy 316 on Instagram at Mike Bundy 316. And if you don't have any way to listen to this episode, you can also find it on YouTube as well. Awesome. And they can find me and follow me at Bill underscore DS on Twitter. Um, and you can follow all of us. I'll mention again on Twitter, geek tavern. Uh, And you can join that Discord and be engaged in the conversation that we have throughout the entire week as well. We would love for you to jump into that Discord, have conversations with us, list your top fives, uh, list your what are you buying, what are you selling, and just play games together. Absolutely. And with that said, everybody, go press start and keep on gaming and watch that movie.